Good evening, I'm Doug Lizette. Tonight on GRC 9's 10 o'clock news, opinions on how to fight street violence from teens and experts. With tapes rolling, Gordon Erlocker and Roy Ruffin have conversations. Prosecutors say prove the former chief stole police money. And the city offers tree owners an option that may help save their trees from the saw. These stories and much more coming up tonight on GRC 9's 10 o'clock news. You're watching GRC Now. It is the people just trying to get a rap, I guess, you know, trying to make themselves known because they shot somebody. Good evening, everybody. How to stop violence in the city? No one in Rochester has come up with an answer that works. So Mayor Ryan is taking the advice of a Harvard researcher who says we need to treat violence before it takes place. Jim Maroney tells us how that idea plays where the violence happens. Reggie Miller's brothers and father picked up their suits for Reggie's funeral today. The 14-year-old boy was fatally shot at a house party Saturday morning. 19-year-old Fred Singleton is charged with Miller's murder. Reggie's family knows why teens resort to violence. Everybody, the reason why everybody getting guns from the people like who do drugs, you know, it's like, you know, they come back. I don't, I just. Yeah. Now I'm gonna press the friends though. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Just wanna go out and press the friends. You know, they figure if this guy shoots somebody and get away with it, well, I might as well try and get away with it. But it shouldn't work like that. They should throw him some time. Your way. The law. And in New York State, the way I feel, is not strict on the penalty. If they make the penalty more strict, I think a lot of this will stop. The best sellers list says this book may have an answer. Police officials and the public, in search of a solution, jammed in an auditorium to hear the author of Deadly Consequences promote violence as a preventable problem. While punishment is appropriate when there's been a violent crime, it's not prevention. And we've confused uh, putting people in jails uh, with preventing violence. Uh, that's like confusing heart surgery with preventing heart disease. We really have to deal with uh, uh, the education, the, the, the culture that promotes violence, the issues of gun availability, substance use, arguments, handling anger. There, there's no other way. Mayor Ryan looks to be an early convert to the deadly consequences way. Ryan spent four hours with Coke Road Stiff earlier in the day. The next question, will the people, like the friends of 14-year-old Reggie Miller, Hear the message. I got something to say. What's that? Well, I'm gonna talk it to the mic. Rest in peace, Reggie. I'm out of here. I'm going home. <laughs> I'm Jim Maroney, Nine News. Fred Singleton, the man who was accused of killing Reggie Miller and shooting the other teen, pleaded not guilty to charges in city court this morning. He's being held without bail. Gordon Erlocker's own words. The jury is hearing them as secretly recorded conversations are played at the former police chief's embezzlement trial. As Warren White reports, the tapes detail how Erlocker allegedly took $300,000 in department funds for his own use and then tried to cover it up. Today's testimony has Gordon Erlocker using department funds for a number of things, among them getting his daughter's car repaired, a round of golf, a trip to baseball spring training in Florida, and countless lunches and dinners. The damaging testimony is from Erlocker's aide turned informant Roy Ruffin on the left. Ruffin turned in October 1990 after Erlocker allegedly said Ruffin would take the fall for any missing money. In the four tapes played today, Ruffin and Erlocker scrambled to find ways to account for misused money. In one tape, they even considered putting it down for expenses during the investigation of serial killer Arthur Shawcross. Ruffin speaks first. Now, how much do you think I should put on that Shawcross thing, roughly? If I do like 20000 you think that's too much? Well, how can I... If but i got to put it in small amounts. Right. And you've got... I don't know how you're going to be able to show that. I mean, what do you... What do you 
thinking of putting it down in. Like we've got. Well, letters. we can probably show a couple thousand that look like they had food and stuff on the investigation, the investigators and everything. Right, right, yeah. And then maybe some form informants, maybe some of the dead informants or somebody. Yeah, what we do you think? Use the girl, that uh, Jean Cicero, or Jean Well, probably could use more than that. I think they had a couple more informants, you know, because I know Dotsy, Dotsy Blackburn was an informant for the okay, Vice Squad, too. Yeah, but Dotsy died before anyone realized we had a serial rapist. Yeah, that's true, too. Talk also concerned claiming $150 in police funds that Erlocker authorized for Mayor Thomas Ryan's primary victory party. Ruffin speaks first. Now, when we did that thing over there for the mayor's thing, that was only like, and I remember we spent 500 but I, I think I don't have a paper in front of me. I think they paid 350 and we paid 150 Well, we can't show that at all. You can't show that at all? Oh, no, no, no. Okay, can, I, that's what I, yeah, you can't because that's the mayor's election, right? right. right. Ruffin, who admitted taking $3,000, guided the conversation to a burglary Erlocker allegedly staged in 1988 to get rid of incriminating office ledgers. Ruffin speaks first. Well, let me ask you, though, now, you just want me to go back to when they supposedly broke in the car, right, which was October the 20th, and that's when my book started, of 88, so that's like yeah, two we years. We can't go any further. Yeah, we can't, because everything, everything was destroyed. You know? Yeah, right. The tone of the other tape conversations played in court today was similar. At one point, there was more talk about getting rid of a Another set of books, and after that, Erlocker saying he would reduce his take from the safe to $200 a week. Erlocker's heard the tapes before. He wouldn't talk when he left court for the day. We'll hear more tapes tomorrow. Warren White, 9 News. In other news today, state taxpayers got their say about how legislative districts rather could be redrawn. The first of many public hearings drew a big crowd because two incumbent Democratic senators may have to run against each other. Redrawing districts impacts all of us because it determines how we will be represented for the next 10 years. Legislator Ron Thomas spoke out against the proposed changes in the 54th district. That's on the county's west side. I believe that if, in fact, you were to do as Assemblyman Faso suggested, and that is combine all of the members of the black and Hispanic community within the city of Rochester within one um, assembly district, I think you, in fact, you would, in fact, dilute the opportunity for black and Hispanic Americans to elect people of their choice. Remember, under the proposed plan, Democratic State Senators Ralph Quattrochaki and John Perry would be in the same district, pitting one against the other. Both say the move was all politics. Eight people new to county government will serve under Executive Bob King. King introduced his newest managers this morning. Also, five staffers hired by Democrat Tom Fry will stay on. Three of the new hires are non-whites. Last month, Urban League President Bill Johnson complained about that King was not hiring enough minorities. I hope that uh, people who have been expressing that criticism uh, uh, might think differently. Uh, I met with, uh, very frankly, Bill Johnson Friday afternoon, who I think is the person you're referring to. Uh, and I said to him, I said, well, you know, we've only appointed six or seven people at that point. I said, just be patient and we'll get there. Patricia Stevens will head up a new cost-cutting commission that will fulfill a King campaign promise to trim county spending. Presidential politics topped the agenda of a New York committee hoping to draft Governor Cuomo for president. The groups mailed postcards to every Democratic household in New Hampshire, urging voters there to write in Cuomo in the primary two weeks from tomorrow. The former Iron, Iron Curtain country of Czechoslovakia opened its doors today to two Rochester educators. RIT President M. Richard Rose and the Dean of RIT's Business College are in Prague to award the first ever MBAs in that country. The graduates studied at a business school RIT helped to establish. Virginia Butler is watching World and National News tonight. She's got a preview for us. Doug, NASA is seeing a new threat to the ozone layer, and it's coming from the major cities of the world. We'll have that story in a moment, but first to the Environment Center with Jim Lytle. We're expecting some snow in our forecast. You can see here in our 3D satellite map some clouds out to the west that are building and moving toward Rochester. There won't be any problems for the morning commute, but that could be a different story by the time you drive home tomorrow. Right now it's clear outside. Our temperature's at 22. East-southeast wind at 3. It's a light wind chill of around 20, 68 percent humidity and a falling barometer. And again, you may want to hear the forecast coming up. We could have some problems driving home tomorrow. We'll check in with Bill now in the Sports Center. All right, Kathy Turner is winging her way to Albertville, France. Today she was named Co-Sportswoman of the Year in Rochester. We'll talk to her later on in sports. 
Coming up on 9 News, the tree you thought you'd lose to a city saw might not get the axe after all. This segment of the 10 o'clock news is brought to you by your old rocket team. Trees damaged by the ice storm may be spared by city chainsaws. Christine Rogers tells us about a two-year reprieve that's being offered, a plan that comes with a big hitch. If you continue this behavior, I'm going to arrest you for obstructing hey. governmental administration. Some city residents were willing to go to any length to prevent crews from removing ice storm damaged trees last spring. The city's position then was those trees belong to us. Residents don't have any say. But now the city is offering homeowners an option, a two-year removal reprieve. So this is giving people that have a different feeling from us the opportunity of a way they can keep that city-owned tree in front of their house. There is a catch to this program. In order to be granted a two-year reprieve, city residents have to agree to assume any legal responsibility if a tree should cause any damage or injury. Under the agreement, homeowners would be responsible for the removal and disposal of any branches that become a hazard. If the tree needs to be removed completely, the homeowner would have to pay for it and be responsible if any falling branches should cause injury or property damage. If someone came to me and said, should I sign it, I would say no. I would say that's not your tree, it's the city's tree. It's not your responsibility to uh, see that the proper thing is done. It's the city's responsibility. That one over there and this one here uh -huh. and that one there. For the past year, Marilyn Roche has been trying to convince the city to save some of the 32 trees slated to be removed on her street, but she says this reprieve isn't the answer. To be perfectly frank, my impression at this point is the city is making some very minor concessions in the hopes that the public perception will be that they've been responsive. I don't think any changes that they've made so far are really going to make any significant difference in the number of trees coming down. Any resident who is interested in the reprieve must contact the city by the end of this week. Christine Rogers, 9 News. In the Satellite Center, Virginia Butler has some more news for us about the environment tonight. Well, Doug, the manager of NASA's Upper Atmosphere Research Program says everyone should be alarmed by what they've discovered about the ozone layer. NASA said today that it's found the highest level of ozone-destroying chemicals ever recorded in the atmosphere. They described the levels of chlorine monoxide as far worse than anyone thought, and the highest concentration is over major cities. They fear a new hole in the ozone layer could form over the Arctic. Well, it's happened again. Another remark from a Japanese official aimed at American workers. This time, the Japanese prime minister said workers lack the ethic needed to be commercially competitive. A governor at a meeting in Washington reacted. I think that this bashing by the Japanese of the United States, and, and specifically of the American worker, is both unfair and it uh, simply exacerbates a bad situation. We are very cognizant that it is an election year. The gathering of governors also reacted negatively to President Bush's proposed $50 billion defense budget cut. They say it should be more. The president says, show me how. What bases do you want to close? What areas do you want to shut down? What weapon systems do you want to knock off right now? Okay. Or do you want to lay off the people? Meanwhile, in Milwaukee, an expert on sexual disorders testified in the sanity trial of serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. He says Dahmer couldn't stop himself. He suffers from necrophilia, which compels him to have sex with dead people. An international children's charity. And on a lighter note, superstar Michael Jackson is taking on the world. He announced today that he wants to raise $100 million by next Christmas to help children and the environment. Jackson will raise the money through an international tour during which he will play Eastern Europe for the first time. That's all for now. Doug? Still ahead on the 10 o'clock news, Jim Lytle with a wintry white forecast. And School 46 carries the Olympic flame in a parade of colors. Well, it looks like some snow developing for your Tuesday. Meteorologist Jim Lytle here now with his forecast. We do have some snow in the forecast, Lee, but we sure had some sunshine this afternoon. That was nice for a change. We caught that uh, sunshine on Sky 9 this afternoon. Lots of sun across our area, and that sunshine was the first significant sunshine we've had around here since 
December or since uh, January 27th and the longest stretch of sunshine we've had around here since uh, December actually we haven't had uh, several hours of sunshine like we had today and uh, it's been a good long month since we've had that we'll show you here in our northeast satellite map what's showing up we have some clouds out to the west and that area of clouds is developing into a storm system you see there over Lake Michigan and that storm is going to track across the southern tier and bring us a chance of snow for our area by tomorrow morning here's where that storm will be just to our west with an area of snow over the western part of our state and over much of Michigan. So the drive to work tomorrow will not be a problem, but that area of snow will drift overhead by mid-afternoon and we'll see snow for the drive home tomorrow with probably a good one to two inches of accumulation. High temperatures tomorrow will be warmer than they were today, probably in the lower to mid 30s. And we'll watch for some very cold air to come down later on in the day tomorrow and especially for tomorrow night and Wednesday. And as that cold air does track across Lake Ontario, lake snow will be developing for Wednesday morning. And so we'll probably have a bad commute on Wednesday morning too, as well as tomorrow, as a couple more inches of snow will probably fall tomorrow night. For Wednesday, here's where the position of that storm will be by then. We'll see quite a bit in the way of lake snow around our area with uh, high pressure blowing across the lake, cold northerly winds. You'll see lake snow over much of western New York. And then we'll watch for colder air to come in toward the weekend with a more significant system that's developing out to our west. Here's our forecast for tomorrow when you wake up. Expect a temperature right around 24 degrees with thickening clouds in our area. By lunch, we'll see the snow begin moving in at 32 degrees. And for dinner, more snow in the area and 29, probably 1 to 2 inches by the time you drive home. Here's for the next three days. Expect some uh, temperatures on the chilly side, especially on our Wednesday. But by Thursday, a little bit of warming and Friday some warming too before the real cold air comes in here for the weekend, Lee. And that's promising to be some very chilly air for this upcoming weekend. And we need to have some uh, more snow cover out there. It's getting kind of bare. Got to tell you, it was nice waking up to sun today, was not it? a Monday. Usually yeah. it's dreary. More sun. All righty, Jim. Next on 9 News, New York's winning lottery numbers and an Olympic send-off for Kathy Turner. Big game in the Big East. Bill's waiting to tell us about it. It really was. Thank you very much, Doug. And hello, everyone. Hey, which would you rather have, a great basketball team that underachieves or a fair basketball team that overachieves? Well, Syracuse has had them both. And I'll tell you what, the overachieving team is a lot more fun to watch on nights like this one. Orangemen's coach Jim Beheim directing a little traffic on the sideline against Connecticut. Big game. National ranked Huskies got the large effort from Brian Fair. Long range, 13 early points from a guy who only averages six. Syracuse responds. Watch Lawrence Moten slicing inside. The freshman scores at the half. UConn, however, had a lead. Second half. Connecticut's Terrence Burrell goes inside. And watch the call on this. Very unusual as he's given the continuation after the foul by Hopkins. Gets the free throw, and the Huskies lead by nine. But Syracuse comes back. Loose ball picked up by Moten, and then it's end-to-end. -end. Coast to coast basket ties the game at 83. And that's how it was the closing seconds of this game. Syracuse ball. Moten takes the shot. Dave Johnson underneath the rebound. Conrad McCray gets the rebound, and he is fouled with just three seconds left. Good fortune or not, McCray is hurt underneath. So Mike Hopkins gets to shoot for him from the free throw line. He hits the first of two, and that's the game. 84-83, Syracuse defeats Connecticut. Great ball game this evening. It's Rochester's Dave Champions. You know that is the 43rd annual celebration of the event. And the guest of honor, hockey great Bobby Hull. The Golden Jets scored 918 goals for the Chicago Blackhawks and the Winnipeg Jets. He was named the 1991 Sports Personality of the Year. It means a great deal to this old dad. After retiring in 1981, I played a little bit in 79 and 80, that people still remember what I did. And if I'd played 23 years professionally and people hadn't remembered what I had done, I would have thought it was all for naught. And when things like this happen in great cities like Rochester and uh, the people in Syracuse next week, they've honored me. It means a great deal to uh, people who are getting to the age that have lived more than uh, half their lives. And I'm very, very flattered. 
of course, the father of Brett Hall. Local luncheon award winner saluting the women today. Your high school athlete of the year, Zilla Higgs, East High, unbeaten in the 100, 200, 400 meter dashes over her four year career. The college athlete of the year, Ricky Cunioto of Brockport State. Academic All-American, Volleyball and Softball, Sports Woman of the Year, co-winners, Kim Batten, represented by her mother Ella, an 87 grad East High, the U.S. National Champion in the 400-meter hurdles, and here's Kathy Turner, Hilton's Olympic-bound speed skating champion who accepted the award and then left for the airport and her flight to Albertville in the Winter Games. I think when I arrive into, into Paris and then we have to go to a, a small town in France to get outfitted and get all the Olympic clothing, I think it'll hit me then. I'm looking forward to the plane trip, though. I really need to just relax and think about all this and, and enjoy it for, for a change. <laughs> Congratulations on the award. Thank you so much. I love you, Rochester. Thank you. She's going to make us proud. Now, Turner was hustled out of the Holiday Inn into a limousine for the trip to the airport. The limo wouldn't start. She caught a ride in a foreign compact. Instead, uh, one of the guys under the hood of the Lincoln was heard to say, see, the Japanese were right. I didn't say that. Rochester Americans had their unbeaten six-game streak snapped yesterday, that game at Binghamton. It was a 5-3 loss to the Rangers. The game brought together two of the AHL's hottest teams. Combined, neither had lost in 15 games. But the Rangers scored a couple of goals just 24 seconds apart in the third period to defeat Rochester and build on what has become a 10-game unbeaten streak. Since Christmas, we've had a fairly full roster and uh, a great team spirit, which is probably the biggest uh, factor in our streak. The Rangers really are building momentum. Just two losses in the last 20 games. They lead the league in points, in goals against, and in goal differential. It's little wonder that Binghamton is considered the league's best team by most. Well, right now, I guess you could say that with the streak we're on. Uh, I think there's uh, you know, five or six teams, though, that are going to you know, really uh, go for it all. You know, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's going to be one team running away with everything. Uh, I still think there's probably about five or six teams that are going to really battle it out right to the end. The Amherst in particular haven't fared well against these guys, winless in five, but they concede little. They've got a lot of experience, you know, they got good de depth on defense and, you know, the, the forwards are doing really well and, I don't know, it's just, I don't know if they're the best team in the league, you know, but we'll see. You don't like to say that. No, no, I think we're the best team in the league. <laughs> All right, Bobby, you know these guys get together again on Sunday. They're a mean team. It's going to be an interesting game. Of course, they play again on Friday. They've got Utica coming in. Dude. All right. Thanks a lot, Bill. Lottery numbers drawn tonight in Albany. Let's take a look at those. The daily number, 454, and tonight's win four combination, 2099. A reminder tonight that cable viewers in some western suburbs will lose their picture in a few hours. Now, between 1 and 6 a.m., GRC will make some technical adjustments. Those are required by the FCC. Rochester cable viewers will not be affected. And finally tonight, one Rochester school is drumming up some winter Olympic spirit. Kids and teachers at School 42 holding an Olympic parade around their school this afternoon. The students wore the costumes and colors of nations taking part in next week's Winter Games in France. The Charlotte School is planning more Olympic fun. It looks like they had a pretty good day for a parade. The Olympic news is just starting. That's right. One last check at our morning weather. Jim Michaels here. We do have some snow in the forecast, but not for the drive to work tomorrow. We'll see temperatures right around 20 degrees when you wake up, or probably a little warmer than that, and then the snow moving in by around noon, snowy commute home. Coming up tomorrow on the 10 o'clock news, you'll hear more tapes from Gordon Urlacher's federal embezzlement trial. Also, efforts continue to settle a contract dispute among Fairport teachers. And money specialist Diana Pilatus has tips to make, make tax time easier. Good. <laughs> Thanks for getting your news from us tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow night at 10, right here on GRC 9. Have a great night, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night. Turn down.